I'm thrilled to be joined today by two nephrology fellows, um, Sam Kant from Johns Hopkins University and Dana Larson from the University of California, San Francisco. Sam, Dana, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Um, so I thought we'd start and really focus on um, for the, the group of fellows who have just started and are beginning their, their careers in nephrology, really to help them um, get off to a, a strong start and, and really you know take advantage of their first year of their fellowship. Um, so Sam, I'll start with you, um, since you're a couple years removed from starting your fellowship. As you reflect back to that time, what's the one thing you wish someone had told you? Um, I think it's... Um, I think the biggest word here is organization. I think um, both in and outside your workplace, um, I could pretty much go on and on about how better you could be organized, but I think focus on that main thing. And I think the other thing, and I, I keep harping about this to other fellows, and I think they're at this point uh, thinking this is my cash phrase is efficiency. I think organization and efficiency, what suits you? Uh, what would be your processes that you could follow to make sure you're actually getting organization and efficiency in the right place is very important. Um, when I say in the hospital, I think there's so many aspects, right? How you navigate the electronic health record, uh, how, how do you synthesize the, the plethora of information that's coming about you? So if you have a process by which you could synthesize all this and organize yourself from the start, I know it's going to be work in progress, but keep in mind that these two would be the major things that you want to get at um, when you're starting your fellowship. And, and Dana, as you think about the last year, and you just completed your first year of, of nephrology fellowship, and, and particularly in responding to Sam's observations, what are some things that you did to be better organized and more efficient? Yeah, I couldn't agree more with what Sam said in terms of organization and efficiency are really the name of the game, especially as a first year fellow. Um, and I would agree with his comment that it's not going to be perfect at first. Like, allow yourself some some different methods and some different approaches. Um, it definitely takes a little while if you're at different sites going through different kind of um, organizational setups, even for yourself, depending on which site you're at. Um, you know, I think. The biggest thing is to kind of find a way where as not the primary team and not always knowing what happened exactly overnight, running through your data, whether that's organizing your initial screen to kind of have all the potassiums listed right away so you can adjust your dialysis orders, um, or just kind of being able to run through your ICU patients early in the morning. Those are some of the, the little things you pick up kind of quicker as you're, as you're kind of starting out as, as a fellow. And I should have asked you, if you think back to the beginning of, of your fellowship, what was the one thing you wish you had known? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I would say the biggest thing that was somewhat of a surprise to me was the amount of communication and that effort involved in communicating with all the various teams, if you will, um, as a fellow compared to residency. Residency, you're in there, you're the one placing the order, checking in on the patient, making sure everything happens. And so a lot of the reliability falls on you. Whereas as the fellow, you're now kind of organizing where the patient is headed and where there's, they're going and what's going to come up next. So it's a lot of communicating, whether that be with your charge nurse of your dialysis. Hey, I have this patient I think is going to need dialysis in a couple hours. We're waiting on X, Y, or Z. Will help improve both your organization and your efficiency to get you through the day. And then also just in communicating with teams, leaving those recommendations and then also kind of secondary recommendations. If this, then you'll need to do this next or page us if this is the result so we can get back involved. And I think that actually the communication piece is what ends up making you more efficient and more organized as you continue along the way. So Sam, it, it just occurred to me that you started your fellowship before the pandemic and then about kind of midway through, you've been sort of training in a very different environment now is is you start, I guess, your third year of fellowship, um, thinking about kind of, at least in the United States, um, things changing and opening up a bit. Just curious as to what's been different during that time. I, mean, I just I hadn't really thought it through, but as I'm sitting here, that must have been a very remarkable sort of experience, both from a positive sense, but also a negative. Yeah, no, for sure. I think, um, you know, this was all pretty much a surprise for all of us, right? The way everything and the way things unfolded. But I have to say, I have to commend the way everyone adapted to it so fast, especially from an educational standpoint. I think programs around the country, um, you know, went into hybrid teaching mode straight away. Um, they didn't want our education to suffer. And, you know, and it's not just my opinion, right? We saw from the recent um, study that was done as well that the, that fellows didn't feel that their education is affected. So 
I have to say, um, we're very lucky that that didn't get affected because it could have easily been a situation where, you know, new conferences where we learn so much and, you know, tend to synthesize so much of what we learn and, you know, assimilate, maybe like the right word for it. Um, you know, they weren't, uh, they weren't suspended. They still went on. I think, um, you know, we, we also got more determined to look after patients. Um, so in so many ways, I think it worked out in a way that, um, I couldn't even believe looking back at things that I think adaptability was the thing that everyone really embraced and, and, and really excelled at. So I'm curious, Sam, for the, for the fellows who are starting their, their, their training now, um, how much of it's different? How much of their experience is going to be different because of what we've experienced with the pandemic? So how has it changed for versus um, those like you who started pre-pandemic? I think, you know, I think people are going to learn from each other's experiences pretty well because, you know, there's always continuity, right? Um, you know, what when the new fellows come on, they won't be seeing the kind of acuity that we saw. So I think um, they will really learn from the experience and be better prepared, I feel, having because in the end, you know, uh, the best learning, of course, they say is from yourself, but even better is when you learn it from someone else. So I think uh, they will be really benefiting from the experience of the fellows that came before them. And, you know, um, you know, if we were uh, at crossroads and facing similar circumstances again, I think we might just have a very good playbook ready for them. And I guess, Dana, for you, you started your fellowship in the, main, in the middle of a pandemic. How, how do you think the group that's starting now, how, how will it be different for them? That's an interesting question, um, especially because I only know the way the one year that we've done. I don't know another way of, of fellowship other than what I've seen and what we've done here. And I think a lot of the changes that we made, like having more clinics be telehealth and having all of our conferences be on Zoom so that we can you know, loop together multiple different sites where different fellows are will actually be continued to be carried over. Some of the changes were very positive um, and people have benefited from them as well, not having to change locations as much, being able to really kind of do group work when you're not next to each other. So, you know, in some ways, I think a lot of the changes that we made, they'll, they'll get to experience as well. I do kind of envy their ability to come together as a class more than our class had the ability to do. Um, parts of fellowship, I think in general, I heard coming in can be isolating. You're all of a sudden by yourself rather than with this team of medicine co-residents. Um, and I think that was enhanced a little bit during the COVID pandemic, uh, despite everyone's best efforts to kind of make us feel included. And I'm so excited to start having gatherings again and getting to meet people, you know, outside of just the very work environment over a screen, um, but really to kind of come together and, and share knowledge and experiences that way as well. So we've talked about the importance of organization, efficiency, communications, adaptability. And then there's this other sort of parallel track of issues around connectivity and telehealth and just sort of thinking about sort of how the, the world may have changed. Um, I, I guess I'm curious, and, and as you, uh, Sam, I'll, I'll start with you because I know you've thought a lot about this. Is, is you... Um, think about someone who's making this huge change in their 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 training as they're thinking about this new focus on nephrology from a kind of technical perspective. What types of, of resources would you encourage people to start to, to use as they start the fellowship? What are what are some of the what helped you the most? Um, I think you know the, the what nephrology is doing in an outstanding way. I think is um, connecting through social media. I think. Um, I mean, I think there are a plethora of resources and, you know, and how to, you know, say even in, in education, you know, you've got the, the renal fellow network, um, you know, where you could always go and see this, you know, there's a, a conference you want to go to or uh, a subject matter that you want to study more. There's always something out there. So I think, um, you know, I can't even like there's so many resources. If I named one, I have to name five more. I mean, that kind of situation. But I think, um, you know, that's the best thing about nephrology currently is that we've embraced social media. We've had a very good foray into it. And then the resources that are available are numerous. I think um, ASN does a great job in that sense as well, that whenever there's a new issue, there's always, uh, you know, a resource available on the website for it. So I would say focusing on the the resources put forward by the major societies in nephrology are a good way to do that. Um, and when it comes to, say, things like telehealth, I think um, another thing that is definitely a step in the positive, in, in the positive direction, and I think um, it's here to stay for sure. 
So Dana, the same question for you. What what resources did you rely on during you know the beginning of your fellowship and then throughout the first year? Yeah, I think that's a great question because coming into nephrology fellowship, your resources are all of a sudden changed from how they were in medicine and a, and a medicine resident where you can kind of just go to up to date and, and and do as the rest of your colleagues were. Um, I started getting very involved in not very. I started getting more involved in um, kind of social me- media networks uh, out there as well. Um, found some podcasts that I really enjoyed uh, listening to that not only provided you with some of the education and the topics, the relevant topics that were out there, um, but also started to form this network of nephrologists that you are newly becoming a part of as a as a first year nephrology fellow. Um, and I feel like almost even more exemplified in COVID was kind of that desire to be part of this this new group and and to get on to that learning curve as steep as it is in the beginning, um, which is as expected, um, just to kind of hear what are the hot topics, um, whether that's kind of joining the journal clubs that, uh, that occur, even just listening and watching um, is a great way to kind of see where the questions are at in the field as you're just coming into it. The other thing is that, um, you know, as even with, say, for example, platforms like, you know, Twitter and social media, I feel there's, you know, in, in a way, quote unquote, it's like crowdsourcing. There's always so much information out there, I think, for fellows. So I would definitely encourage them to use it in the right way to to at least get, you know, because there's so many events now that are happening virtually, you know, they could be, you know, uh, even local state societies have those things. So I would use this as like a crowdsourcing way where you could actually get a, a lot of information and actually choose what you really want to do. Now there is, you know, there's, I would say, limitless options at this point. So, Sam, I guess the the follow-up to that or the response would be, how do you best differentiate high-quality information from information which may not be accurate? Um, I think... The nephrology societies, I think, have done a, a great job of, um, you know, sieving through um, the most important information in a very accurate way. I think we've responded very well in the era of, you know, um, misinformation, uh, as they will say, you know, that we've actually done a very good job. So I think, um, you know, both societies, ASN and NKF, have, have actually embraced that whole issue in a big way. So, you know, I would and say, you know, most of the experts of the field are a vital part of these societies. So to use whatever resources they have um, to the fullest, um, I would, you know, totally trust whatever they would say on that front. Of course, there's always a part of uh, me that's always going to question things and bring forward. But, you know, in many ways, both the societies have been very responsive to that as well, uh, if, if there's ever any inaccuracy to it. But um, I think those things would be, I think these societies would be the most credible source of information, I would say, for fellows for now. And, and, and Dan, I guess just to to kind of, I'm curious if during your first year you started to change how you interacted both with information on social media, but also as you thought about different resources and, and kind of curious as to what that journey was like for you. Yeah, I think I honestly think Sam brought up the greatest point, which is as you gain more experience, you can ask the questions yourself. Oh, you know, this this book chapter or this, you know, Twitter tweet, um, this site is saying something very different from what I've seen here. And it it kind of drives as as you have the more experience, it drives you to like ask the question, well, why do we do this here? Is this even right? Or how does this relate to the experiences that I've had? And I think only through kind of time and and gaining experience in the primary field can you ask the right questions yourself as you're going through it um i do think to some extent social media provides such a great peer review just by the fact that anybody can see it and comment on on it and and provide updates oh that's not what we do we do this x y or z um and i think that always is the the question for kind of the social media sites as you go through and, and people are thinking different things um really having that that third peer review of the general public. It's almost like a phase four clinical trial, um, kind of in, in, in my perspective. I'll say my own journey through it is I initially was very kind of centralized, um, focused on just the materials I was given from my own institution. And I feel like now as I've gotten towards the end of the year, it's starting to look more at those kind of national sites. What are they putting out, especially as you study for your ITE and, and those kinds of things that push you forward and um, drive you to kind of find, find the next step of the question. And Sam, what Dana just said in terms of um, 
one of the advantages of social media is the fact that people can comment is, is where you were going with the crowdsourcing. I just want to make sure I understood that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, because, you know, people are sharing their experiences. Um, and, you know, as we know, medicine is, you know, it's, it's like a universe, right? And in the end, um, they share their experiences, um, say a patient syndrome that might differ, you know, you might have one disease, but may have many disparate presentations. So you learn so much from it. You know, I mean, a lot of times I have to say, you know, I'd be, you know, seeing a patient, I would remember that one presentation that someone had put up as a case report on Twitter, you know, um, and I'd be like, oh, yeah, this is what it is. And it's, it's, you know, it's like the Eureka moment, you know, so it's really worked out in a way that um, I, you know, I couldn't even fathom. Um, and, and the more I look in my rearview mirror, I have to say, um, if, if done the right way, I think social media is definitely going to help us in a big way. And just one other thing to clarify with you, this uh, Dana made the point about um, resources. And as, as the year went on, she was seeing sort of more information kind of from outside the institution. I'm just curious if that was your experience as well during the first year. Uh, absolutely. I think I think the biggest thing is that um, once you, you know, once you've got centered and settled at your institution, I think it's important to foray and connect with other fellows and faculty from outside because, you know, you don't need to just have one or two mentors. It's okay to have multiple because, you know, you might have one mentor that's your research mentor, one's your clinical mentor. Um, so, you know, you will always cross collaborate and then that's how the specialty grows. So I think, um, you know, there are so many mentor programs that, you know, the societies do as well. And I've, I've met multiple through that process and as a result, even done research projects with them. So I think that's how it, I think, works out once you're looking outside your institution. So Dana, before we close, um, Sam and I need to, to recognize the fact that you were chosen as the fellow of the year at um, UCSF. And, and as I understand it, you were recognized for your collegiality, your thoughtfulness, and your commitment to teaching. Um, congratulations on that honor. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. It's a, a huge, huge honor, as you said, and just a privilege to get to work with interns and residents every day and kind of walk them through the same questions that we're, we're answering and helping to ask at the same time, too. From that perspective, I'm just curious as to how, you know, as you become a fellow or, you know, you really do, you are now in sort of this mentor role for the residents and the students. How did you approach that responsibility, particularly at the beginning of your fellowship year? Yeah, I wish I could have approached it differently, to tell you the truth. COVID made it really tough to be the fellow that I had imagined being, um, to kind of be able to stop in on teams and see them um, and do kind of teaching more directly. Um, it was quite limited in the beginning of fellowship, and so a lot of it ended up taking place over the phone. And I actually just was able to get with my first medical students like two months ago that were back on our team, which, if anything, is, adds like such an excitement at this time of the year and kind of drives you forward. Um, I guess my advice is just to like, for a second, remember back to when you were that, that intern and you were terrified to call the fellow or someone for help, but also needed the help. Um, it also helps if you've been able to get a little bit of sleep. So I try to prioritize sleeping myself as well, because there's always those conversations you have that aren't as great when you haven't slept quite as much. Um, but really just taking an interest, you know, in them just as, as you wanted and, and remembering back when you were that that resident or intern as well. And Sam, how about for you? I'm curious as to how you would answer the question about being a mentor and, and teaching students and residents and then increasingly fellows. Yeah, no, I think, you know, since nephrology is mostly a consult service and in, in most centers, I think, you know, I, I look at each consult as a teachable moment for residents. Residents, I have to say, are very eager to learn, especially nephrology. Um, and they always have so many recurring questions from it. So, you know, whenever I am giving recommendations to a resident about what we're planning to do and what, you know, what, what test to order, I think you could always use that as a minute uh, of, of, of a teachable moment. I think they really appreciate that. And it really helps our own growth as fellows as well, because in the end, you know, we're there to teach. We're there to enhance how we convey information in the way we deliver it as well. I think that's that's really really important from that front. I think um, Dana was making uh, you know another important point about um, the you know about having having like a game plan for for these for for you know for the students and and also the residents. It's important to kind of know what they're really looking for because they have a specific question 
knowing how to approach it, um, teaching them how to approach it because, you know, next time they look at it, they're like, yeah, I know how to deal with this. Um, so I think, you know, it's coming up with ways by which you could convey your information and in, or crystallize it in a way that they hold on to it I think would be your biggest thing. The last point that Dana made about sleep, such an important one. I think we should really treat sleep as a superpower in, in fellowship because it really, really changes so many things for us. I think um, as a society, we don't, I don't think we value sleep as much as we should. Uh, but I'm not saying sleep for 12 hours a day, but at least get your, you know, get your requisite amount that you, at least you feel like you're delivering the best um, to your patients, uh, peers. Uh, I think it's a very important thing. So if one last question for both of you, um, Sam, I'll ask you first, um, and, and, but I'm curious as to how both of you will answer this. And you have to answer it differently. So, so Dana, you're, you're going to have the harder job here, I think. Um, what, one, what one thing would you do to, to increase interest in nephrology as a career? Um, I had a feeling this was coming. <laughs> but I think, um, I think the, the, the pathophysiology, pathophysiology of nephrology, I think is the most attractive thing. Um, I think if we if we, you know, I think we already do a pretty good job of it, but I think conveying it further, as I previously mentioned, I might be repeating my point here, but I think, you know, it, I think it's a pathophysiology that drew a lot of us to nephrology. I think that's to, you know, I think we need to advertise that more to show them how, how cool it can be. Um, cause it is truly, you know, because the moment I, I explain one really cool aspect about the kidneys to the residents there, I'm, I'm not kidding. They're awestruck and they're just like, okay, we didn't know this existed and this is so much fun. I was like, yes, it can be, you know, I mean, the physiology of it all is just amazing. And I think the second biggest thing, um, and I speak for myself and other fellows that at least I interact with is the long-term association that you have with patients. I think most of us got into medicine because of the people aspect. And, um, you know, I think they need to know this, that in the end, we are looking after these patients for a number of years. We, we're, you know, we're there with them to true thick and thin from the point that have an AKI to probably developing CKD dialysis and then getting a transplant. You know, there's a very good longitudinal care pathway here that we could really, really, you know, advertise further. That's a, that, that this is what makes nephrology um, a truly a specialty that looks after so many things for people. So, so Dania, um, Sam made your job harder because he did two and, and from very different ends of the spectrum, pathophysiology and, and sort of continuity of care and, and relationship with patients. So what would your answer to the question be around sort of how to increase uh, interest in nephrology careers? Yeah, I love it. I think that's the question everyone's asking right now. It's how do we continue to increase uh, interest in and getting them, the young ones, as I say, into nephrology. And gosh, I wish I knew the answer. Um, a couple of things that come to mind, I think, twofold. I can do <laughs> twofold like Sam as well. Uh, the first is just being passionate about what we're teaching. I think especially when you're the medical student or kind of the early resident, seeing someone who's really passionate about what they're do, doing and sharing it in a digestible manner. Um, I know when I was at ASN two years ago, there was a great poster, and I'm going to forget who exactly presented it, um, about reasons people don't go into nephrology. And some is that it's hard. It's a hard topic. It's not easy to understand. And I think that just adds emphasis to kind of things that I'm personally interested in, like medical education. How can we help to, to break it down and make it exciting and, and something that they can enjoy learning uh, the, little, the little niches about to make it all come together as an understanding? And then two, I want to like thank my colleagues that are on the pushing forefront of research because the other thing is I think people become disengaged as they go through residency and just don't see kind of the vibrant living parts of nephrology that are still left to be discovered. And that I think like the SGLT2 studies that just came out this year and now there's kind of this whole new aspect and, and new things that we can recommend and add and kind of the evolving nature that nephrology needs to continue to, to go down in order to better serve patients and to continue to attract people into our field. So let me try to summarize what I've heard from both of you today. And this has just been a remarkable conversation. And, and you know, both of you clearly are passionate about the field, but also incredibly thoughtful as you think about nephrology as a specialty in, in healthcare and medicine. Um, so it looks like we've got maybe 12 or 13 pieces of advice. So organization, efficiency, communication, adaptability was sort of where we started. 
then we had a discussion around, you know, changes related to sort of telehealth and how we'll be connecting among, you know, different um, sites and sort of the opportunity to use technology to be more connected. Then there was a set of discussions or advice around social media and online resources, um, really participating in the different kidney societies. Obviously, I'll make a plug for ASN, but ASN and NKF and others do provide um, free membership to, to fellows, so to take advantage of that and the resources. Um, but then there are resources outside your institution and outside the organizations and, and networking. And then the last group was um, embrace being a mentor to, to residents and students, but really, you know, that's something you need to be proactive and have a game plan. Um, I love the terminology of sleep as a superpower. That's one I'm probably going to steal and use in the future. And then this issue of always questioning and asking why. Um, so let me stop there and, and see, uh, Sam, Dana, did I did I summarize your discussion and your 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 pearls to the incoming fellows correctly? Couldn't have done it better, Todd. Yeah, that you. was fantastic. Thank you. Well, they're, they're your ideas. I'm just stealing them and claiming them as my own. So um, there's, a, there's a joke in there about publishing and stealing it. But um, but just to summarize as well, you know, I think the four pieces that you emphasized, your four priorities for as we try to increase interest and continue to increase interest in nephrology careers around emphasizing the pathophysiology, emphasizing sort of continuity of care and the relationship, the long-term relationship with patients the importance of being passionate about the field, and then also, you know, emphasizing everything that's happening related to, to incoming research, discovery, and innovation, and all the excitement around the future. Um, you know, those there's an opportunity here for all of us that's really exciting. Sam, Dana, let me give you the last word. So, um, in, in closing, what would you like to communicate to the fellow? Sam, do you want to go first? Yeah, no, I think um, I would just say listen to Todd's summary. Um, I think that would be something that, you know, I, I wish I had that at the start. It would have been, I mean, I, I think my institution supported me a lot, but I think, you know, we need to have extra pointers. I think just listen to Todd's summary and I think you'll be fine. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Uh, kind of summarizing the last little bit that we've been able to chat here. Um, but on top of that, something that my dad always told me was work hard and have fun. And I think that'll get you a lot of places, especially in the start when you're just trying to sort through it um, yourself and 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 learn as you teach up. And above all, I think it's important to have compassion for yourself. I think don't be good to yourself all throughout. You know, it's going to be, um, you know, a, a, a year where you're going to be busy, but be very good to yourself. I think it's very important. Well, Sam, Dana, thank you very much for taking the time to have this discussion. And, and really, I just wish you the best year um, as you continue with your fellowship training. And to all the fellows, particularly those that are starting, um, just you know, congratulations and um, very excited for what you're going to do for the field, but also as you participate in ASN and other organizations and, and really improve care for the millions of people with kidney diseases, with kidney failure, and with kidney transplants. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you.